here and here. Well, we're going to do make a, good progress on that. I mean, all of these are between the, uh, you know, Amazon was Ooh, stuck. Yeah. It all has shoulders and all. Yeah. But like in that case, you have to like hurry up setting up the user and all that. And it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. I mean, I have enough for this to fly yeah, for the scratch. Yeah. It's just, it's just it's like, you know, if you have, I think like, you know, like, you can get I mean, I, okay. I, like, I already have enough. This is more difficult for Android, I felt like. I mean, like in Python, for instance, is so. Like, yeah, I, I can't. I'm going to look at it again. I'm going to try it. And we can just, like, let it, I guess we could just change the driver, too. And, like, we can look at it and change the principle of it, too. Okay. But I think it should be developed and be faster. Just do it quickly. Okay, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'll give you guys the schema so you guys can develop it with it. And also, we need a way to process the data, so we need to make it as digital and like, oh, what's cool. Yeah, so I just want to store the process. Yeah, so maybe this one might do things if you want is this chip that she talked about. How do you know that neurons has a middle piece of the So his project idea is that actually doesn't have to still sort of matter. It's not just a chip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not just a chip. 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 Which is a that I feel like this was a big difference. Yeah, I mean, I really this was that if you play Twinkle Twinkle the same shape, like, what go from up to the, like, what do you want to do? That's the seven year old matter of which you're down. This octave, that octave, or that you're just So does that always sound right? Like, if you're on the key and you're Seven up or whatever it always is. Okay, so. Yes, I mean, I mean, it's adjustable. I did that just in case someone was skeptical. I didn't actually listen to it myself because I didn't think it was a good thing. I thought it was helpful for you guys. Yeah, I mean, if that was a good thing. But I mean, like, so. So that's like the reason it doesn't really support bare minimums. But really, it says once you build a mobile, you can use it for the same problems. So I can use it to kind of for music wise. This strip, yes, that's the music that's of the actual key value, but it's a key chain of the strip that can mock this. Maybe the octave or the octave. Right, but if you, uh, you might want to know uh, two tracks, how do I say the wire? I'll say the wire. 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 I'll say I'm just saying you might want something. I'm just saying. But like somewhere else. I mean, yeah. this, yeah. Is, so this by itself is a change. You mentioned yeah. but it was yeah. the people who okay. gave you that voice. Yeah. The only way to do uh, that. I think about that way to pre process the data and then you can get a data report in the world. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, um, so welcome back to class. Um, so I see I've got some good questions on the, on the first talk, on the second homework already, which has already been posted. Um, so if you have any more questions, please um, post them to, um, um, you can post them to Canvas. Um, let's see. Um, the other thing that came up is the notes on the on the web page. Uh, um, I, I, I update those every year, and I've updated the first half or so of the notes. And you can tell because, well, for one thing, 
there's a jump in the numbering. I've reordered things a little bit um, in the number at the top. But also, there's a date. You should find a date at the bottom that says 2016. Um, if it's not that that date yet, then then I'll probably update those before I, I give the lecture on that topic. And the same goes for the homework. Someone somehow found a version of a, of a homework from 2013. Um, if you answer those questions, you'll you'll probably answer them incorrectly because I've, ch I've, I've changed them a little bit. Uh, so, it's a, um, so just something to be on, um, you know, on, the, on the lookout for. Um, okay, so today is the last lecture on, is the last lecture on, on dealing with distances and similarity, but this will, these things will be used um, in the in the clustering section and also in, in the regression section as well. So we'll keep keep using these concepts. Um, so we'll start clustering next week on Monday. Um, okay. So back to the problem at hand here. The, the idea is we're going to have some um, um, some large um, data set P, where say the size of P. So it's a set, and I can take this set notation for the, as the cardinality of the set. Um, so, so let's say some, this is um, this is something like one million. And then the kind of the two important um, questions are um, um, which pairs P and P prime in the set P are um, close, and so you can define close based on some notion of distance and some threshold which you can specify. And um, so, um, so, given an um, um, given a query point Q, which is from the same universe as P. Um, find the the closest point P in P to Q. Um, so, so we phrased the second one a little bit differently before. Um, we want to say, is there something that's the same as the query Q in the set P? Is there something the same or something close to the same? One way of doing that is having a distance and finding the closest thing, and if that's close enough, then you say that um, that these are the same. Um, so, so one way of thinking about this is saying that, let's say P, um, let's say this star is going to be R min P and P of some distance that we're going to use between P and Q. And let me and so we can, we'll often write this as phi with this um, subscript that's an uppercase P, more clear in the, in the LaTeX, and so query Q. So this is, so who's seen this arg mid notation before? And who's not seen this? Okay, every year a few people haven't seen it. So the minimum, this is essentially, I'm, it's a, the min of, of an element so of any element in the set P, you want to minimize this function, which is the distance, and the argument is the argument that minimizes it. So it's the object P, the point P, which minimizes this distance, right? So that's what we'll call that P star. That's the nearest neighbor of Q in the set P. So we want to find this nearest neighbor. Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to what happens in low dimensions, but before I, but part of we talked about with locality sense of hashing, and with um, and, and also part of the lecture today will be with with high dimensional data, and we talked about this um, th these ideas of um, so, um, so high dimensional. Um, Euclidean spell that right. Uh, um, Euclidean 
um, data. Where does high dimensional Euclidean data come from? We talked about these warnings about you know, using Euclidean distance or most distances when the, the different coordinates of something have, if, if, the, if, the, if the units are different, this can cause all sorts of strange problems. So, and so, so maybe the, the intuitive way to think about this high dimensional data is you have, a, you have a data set, each data point is a customer, and each dimension is an attribute of them. But these may not match height and weight, they don't have the same units, you can't really, it's hard to define the right way to find a distance over these. So, so where do you get this high dimensional data that makes sense to think of it in, in, in the Euclidean distance? Um, so, I thought I'd just describe a few ways where this comes from, and then I will uh, go through one in, in, in a little bit more detail, or a few in a little bit more detail. So one is in one is in time series, and so I'll, I'll just I mean there's much deeper modeling that, that goes into this. But the idea is if you have something like a, um, like, the, like the price of a stock or the, um, or like the temperature measure, at every, say at every certain time point, maybe it's the closing of a, of a day or it's the, the high or it's the temperature at noon, um, at every day or every hour, you're going to get a sequence of these uh, of these measurements. Um, so, so let's just say that the, the temperature today every hour was something like, uh, you know, maybe the very early this morning at, at 1 a.m. and then 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. the temperature was 15 degrees Fahrenheit, 15, 16, um, 18, and this is it you know, and so on. So you get these different readings of the temperature, okay, and so then if you have a string, what you might want to do up until right now, I guess my, let's say it's 35 degrees right now, and you may decide to take a sequence of these, say of length um, 10, and this describes like a, a, a 10 dimensional point. Right, so now, like you can't, now it, it gives you the temperature over an hour, over, over a span of like 10 hours, and the way you'd want to use this would be in various models where maybe you'd weight these in, in different ways based on some, some models of how it's correlated. Um, but these all have the same units, and you occasionally want to look up, say, sequences of these stock prices or of these temperatures in some in some sequence. There's, there's, there's various ways you want to do this. I'm not going to kind of get into them. Um, but this might be a way you might model some of the data that some of you have talked about for the project. Um, so this is just, but again, they all have the same units which avoided that problem, um, 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 which avoided the problem we had before. Um, so there's also, okay, so that's all I want to say about time series. Um, in Um, so in machine learning, there's um, this idea of there's this idea of using kernels um, to use this kernel trick, where instead of say building a linear classifier, you would build a, a nonlinear classifier. And if you do these radial basis kernels, these actually look like a, like like it looks it looks like a Gaussian kernel. And one of the issues is that you can you can do all the same thing like finding classifiers or, or doing regression on this data uh, by just using the inner products, which is essentially what, what, the, what the kernel is here. Um, and so if you haven't seen all this before, I, I'm not going to get enough detail so you can follow it, but if you've seen these kernel tricks before, so between two points, this is, replaces, the, or replaces the dot product you'd use in, in Euclidean space. And so you can do everything by just using this kernel, um, but then to start with n data points, you need to create an n by n matrix of all these inner products.
to do a lot of the work. And this can be too space or cost, um, cost inefficient. So there's a way to approximately lift this um, into a Euclidean space that's pretty high dimension. The M depends on some accuracy parameter. So if you want accuracy that's some eps, you know, some added to bear, so these values, these inner products value vary between 0 and 1. If you want error between epsilon, say 0 0.01, you need roughly 1 over epsilon squared features. And so you lift them to this high dimensional space, and so if you have hundreds of millions of data points, which happens in various ways, um, a lot of these internet companies have data sets like this, then you can lift it to maybe a 10,000 dimensional space, and now creating the inner product using these vectors is a dot product again. And the natural distance associated with these is the Euclidean distance. This maps um, without any error into something called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, but that's technically infinite dimensional and you can't really work directly with it other than um, as a functional space. But this gives you an actual embedding and then you use Euclidean distance and it's really high dimension. Um, okay, so those are a couple of other examples. Um, so if you've seen those before, maybe those are useful to explore more. We'll talk a little bit more about how to get this data from images. And there are two ways to think about treating images as high dimensional vectors where you want to use the Euclidean distance. The, and a, again, Euclidean, I mean, we talked about, that's the L2 distance we talked about in the last lecture. Um, the first way, so the, I mean, the most important thing is to first realize, and you know, this used to be much, much more obvious. Um, but if you, if if you're talking about image, um, it's actually made up of these little pixels. So I don't know, like when the internet first came about, and you loaded up images, you could see all the pixels, right? Because it took a long time. Now they're so high resolution, you like this may not be something you notice anymore. But images, they're pixels, that means it's a bunch of these little squares. And I can see nicely, and on the on the notes that I'll post on the webpage, you can see a grid underneath there, but you can think of each of these as, as pixels. Let me try and draw a few of these down the corner. And so each of these This is a pixel, and each of these pixels has a value. If it's a black and white image, which is a lot easier to think about, it's just a gray value between 0 and 1. Um, and usually, actually, not between 0 and 1. It's usually between 0 and 200, and, or maybe 1 and 256. Usually, the, usually that's enough. If you look at like the E ink on my watch, I think I only have, have 32 values for color. Um, but that's so pretty good. Um, you know, even 256 is, is usually plenty of different colors. And so often you're going to get not just one gray scale value, but actually one that you get a red, green, and a blue value, which makes up a color. So you're going to get three numbers for each of these. But for now, we'll just talk about just the gray scale numbers. Okay, so now let's say that the image actually consists, here's about everything I can draw, of someone's face. Um, let me try and draw these with, with the pixels, so this is going to look kind of weird. Um, let's see, these pixels are going to all be colored red, and then we're going to leave some eyes in there. Okay. <laughs> right, so, so, so just so I want you to keep in mind that this is, these are, these are actually pixels here, right? So that looks like a, like a face, and then they're, they've got a neck here. And they've got a body, you know, this is very, very horrible art. Um, right, so these pixels are all filled in, right? So that's a picture of a, of a person, right? So each pixel is black if it's, or if it's the person, and it's white if it's the background, right? Okay, so, and, and maybe it's not black or white, it's some values in between there, but this, now you have all these pixels, and um, so you can convert this into, into a vector. Um, 
in, there are kind of two common ways. The simplest way is just to think about if this is a, if, if, if the number of pixels is 100 by 100, so that means I go 100 here and 100 here, then I'm going to turn this into a 10,000, then d equals equal 10,000, 10,000 um, dimensional vector. So if you remember with vectors, the order of the coordinates matters. So I can just arbitrarily, basically what you, would, what you do is you kind of go through and order these come first, and then these, you know, so you come, come back here, and then you cut across, and you just string them out, you vectorize this, this, uh, this, this square, right? Um, and, and so you just string them out into 100 at a time, 100 times, and you get this, these 10,000 dimensions. Okay, and, and so this is, you get these 10,000 dimensional data points. And so um, there have been a few projects in the class where people have analyzed some pictures like this. One of the limitations of this is basically if you're trying to analyze objects, and often people do this with faces, pictures of people, there are data sets out there where they've, they've been pre-processed, so the face is always in the same spot in the picture. They basically made it so the whole thing not, doesn't have this beautifully drawn body here, but it just has the face in the picture. And so the nose and the eyes are all essentially in the same spot. So they've kind of regularized it. And then you can try and do analysis on faces after they've been somewhat aligned already in these pixels. Right? And so they may even be, 100 by 100 pixels is probably plenty for analyzing faces, um, possibly. At least there's some data sets where you can start to do interesting things with them already, because the variation in faces is much larger than what you get if you go smaller pixels. But if you, if you take a picture with a high-powered camera, it's going to be much more than 100 by number of pixels here. So you get much larger vectors. Okay, so this only works, um, this only works if um, pre-aligned. Okay, so, 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 so this was kind of computer vision in the 1980s and 90s, actually, often, often worked this way. They looked, they kind of did stuff that was thought to be pre-aligned, or they tried to do processing on things, kind of thinking of it in this way. There was a shift in the 90s with an algorithm called SIFT, that what it did is it tried to pick out interesting um, pixels, and it used the structure more of the, uh, of that this pixel is next to this pixel, and these other pixels here. And what it tried to do is to find certain pixels which are on corners, right? So th these are, if I look at a box around here, these guys are, are inside, these are inside, and these, and these other ones here are outside here. And if you try and detect this, this is in, something interesting is going on here because it's, it's at the corner um, with this guy with shoulders that are really pointing. Um, and so these, these corner things or other sort of things that have very sharp gradients tended to be the interesting parts of pictures. So what people would do is they, they take these pictures and scan for things that had these interesting features and then throw these into a database. So every picture generated a bunch of features that it threw into a database. So each picture was many data points. And so then if you wanted to find a similar picture, you generate all of its data points and look for similar data points in, this, in, in, in the database. And if many of these, uh, of these data points aligned to another picture, it probably had a similar object. It had lots of similar features to it even if they're scrambled. So for instance, if one picture is, is directly and the other one is a selfie through the mirror, so everything is reversed, it should still work. Right? And so there are these pictures of cars. They, so certain things you can identify really well in computer vision. One is people. There's a lot of work on that. The, another is cars. People are great at identifying cars. And cars have various features like around the wheels. They're very distinctive and so forth. Um, so it's tended to find these, these, these features. And so let me just give a brief overview of how these SIFT features work. Um, 
the idea is if I look at again a single pixel here in the middle, then I can um, I, I can kind of label the the pixels around it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so there are eight pixels around this one here in the middle. Um, and so, so SIFT stands for Shift Invariant Feature Transform. Um, but really, it's trying, to, um, it's trying to find these features which are going to be, um, yeah, I should have said this, these features should be um, invariant to, to, um, to scale and um, rotation and, and shift. So, so sh the shift was made it into the acronym, the scale and, and uh, rotation didn't. But the shift is kind of the big thing, right? Before, if I just use the vector, the direct vector representation, I, if I shift the image off by one pixel, it completely changes, right? Um, but if this should be invariant, the feature will look the same even if I shift it by <coughs> I take away this strip of pixels and add them on the end here. The feature locally will look the same. Okay, and so it's using, so if I take some pixel in the middle here, I look at all these eight neighboring pixels. And so I first thing I do is I find the one that has the largest, um, the, the, that, that has the largest gradient. So the difference in the values between these two is the largest. And let's just talk about the grayscale values so I can just compare the, 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 the differences between them. There's a number between 1, 2, 56, the largest difference between those two numbers. And then kind of I'm going to relabel these. So in, I think in clockwise order, starting from the first, starting from the one with the largest grade. This kind of gives me an orientation of the pixel. Okay, and so this gives me eight, um, um, eight coordinates by doing this, and I've somehow rotated them, and that's supposed to make it invariant to rotation. I laid eight possible rotations. It turns out that this works works well enough. Um, so to do this, um, and so this deals with shift and rotation because I do this for every pixel. This takes care of rotation. To deal with scale, instead of looking at just one set of neighbors like this around a pixel, I do this at, um, it, it, it does something I won't get into, and I won't describe this in full detail, it's kind of, kind of complicated, but it, it repeats this for, um, it, it, it creates a similar thing here at four different scales at the four neighbors. So it'll do it not just at this pixel, but at four neighbors, and the notion of neighbors is at four different scales. So it's here, it's also, so I, instead of making it a one by one pixel to its neighbor, I'll look at a set of four pixels and look at all their neighbors of size four, and I take kind of an average of these values. So it, it does this at four different scales. So I'm going to get four times four different scales, this is going to be 16 kind of um, scale components. And for each one of these scales, I'm going to use eight coordinates somehow. Okay? Um, it's, it's kind of a strange construct, but what you end up getting is eight times 16 is 128, um, 128 dimensions. You end up joining all these together, and you get 128 dimensions for each of the uh, for each of the feature pixels, and then and the and these are all scalar values, and so the right way people think of the distance between them is 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 using the Euclidean distance, and so this is generally what's used in computer <coughs> um, And and so so there was this algorithm was this has an interesting story. Um, there is a. Um, um, so, uh, um, so there's this researcher, David Lowe, and he tried to publish this, this technique um, over the course of like five or eight years and couldn't get it published at all. 
finally published it in some kind of um, lower level journal. And since then, it's been cited like over 10,000 times, or maybe more than that. Um, some huge number, um, where it's something like over half of all the citations at that journal for some period of 10 years came from this one paper. Um, it's, it's, it's something pretty crazy. And it, this was used, and basically, most the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of computer vision was based on either these techniques or there are some variants of these that map to a different high dimensional space. There are some other ways of creating these features, but these SIP features work, work pretty well. So you get this high dimensional representation of key points within these images. And then you use these to find, and the key thing is then to find the nearest match to these. So you want to do a nearest neighbor algorithm, find all the similar objects. So one way is to use the locality sense of hashing that we talked about. And this actually works fairly well for this. Um, but there are other techniques that also work well that are kind of based on lower dimensional constructs. And so the rest of the lecture I'm going to be, be talking about these instead. So locality sense of hashing meant for arbitrarily high dimensions. It didn't care how high the dimension was. Um, these were things that will work for medium to fairly large but not too large size dimensions. And there are ways to get them to work in 128 dimensions. And I'll kind, of, I'll kind of build up to these the rest of the lecture. OK? So who had heard of SIF features before? OK. Every year, it's a little bit less and less, if I think. Um, but these were like all the rage in computer vision. Now, this deep learning techniques are, 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 taking, are taking over, kind of replacing these. Um, if you think of, if you know about deep learning, kind of the first le level of the deep neural net is finding types of features, and those features are kind of being used in place of the SIF features. And they, they tend to work better, but not, you know, not too different than if you had just had the first layer just seeded with the SIF features of, of the image. Um, so this kind of figured out manually well ahead of what deep learning figured out how to do kind of somewhat automatically. OK, so let's talk about this. So let's, let's talk again about the nearest neighbor problem. Um, okay, so let's start with the problem, just to review, um, let's start with data in, in just one dimension. So we'll start with a point set, which is, sorry, is a, is a subset of R1. So, again, this, this notation, um, this is in the, well, yeah, so this is just reals, okay. So, um, so if you have data set, and this could be large, you want to find the nearest neighbor to a query, how would you, now with pre-processing, pre-process the data set so you can quickly find the nearest neighbor. We talked about this briefly, what is kind of a conventional way to do this? Yeah, so, so you build a balanced binary tree on top of here. Um, let's make these. <coughs> so, so you build a balanced binary tree on top of here. Um, and you kind of store these also. You can store them in a, in a list. So, so, or in some sort of linked list on the bottom. So now what you do on the query is you say, you, you, you um, at each node you store the kind of one of the elements which is splitting it. And you say, okay, so th this is the split element here. And so my, my, my query point is on this, um, let's see, that's gonna be your left side of the split. So I go down to this tree down to this subtree, I go this direction and this direction, and I can find one of the points which is either just to the left of it or just to the right of it. If it's just to the left, I can also use the linked list to also check here, and I know one of these two points must be the nearest neighbor. So you can do this in, in log n time. And the space complexity of this is, uh, is linear. 
so that red dot is between those two blue dots. I mean, so what if it was equal distance? Which which one is the nearest neighbor, or is it kind of arbitrary? Yeah. Um. So, uh, um, so at that point, it's arbitrary, right. and we're going to make it even more arbitrary in a second. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it's it could it could be either one of those. But you know, it must be one of those two, or they're equal distance. Yeah. Um, okay. So if you instead have data sets in in two dimensions. So now let's draw here. Right? So how do I find the nearest neighbor now? Well, before I talk about that, let me say, let's, let's look at this, actually the structure of these, of these nearest neighbors first. Um, there's what I can do is I can actually, you know, I, I, if I have a query point, I know this point is the closest. That has to be the nearest neighbor. But I can, I can say something more interesting. I can kind of draw, I can divide up the plane so that, um, so into these regions. this to these regions. So if I'm anywhere in this region, this is the nearest neighbor. If I'm anywhere in this region, this is the nearest neighbor. This is called the, um, the Voronoi diagram. Okay. And so if I'm asking a nearest neighbor question, I'm really asking about this diagram. I need to be able to figure out which cell of this diagram I'm in. That's that's precisely tells me which is is the nearest neighbor. Okay. And so these lines are bisectors between these points, and you kind of draw them out, um, and that's kind of how you draw it. Um, and so if the points are are not um, if if they're in kind of if they have continuous coordinates and they're not in some strange position, then in the plane these all meet at, at, uh, at there are three lines that meet at any place. And these lines go down to infinity and so forth. Okay? So it seems like if, if I can just construct this, this diagram, um, then I can answer nearest neighbor queries um, pretty efficiently. It turns out in 2D that you can construct this diagram um, and that, so in, in R2, this, the size of this diagram um, is, 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 is all event. Okay, this, the size is linear the number of points. Um, and by the size, I mean, I'm going to write down all these intersection points and the lines that go between them. I can kind of describe all of the line segments that describe this diagram in linear space. And then you can build kind of a query structure on top of it um, that queries in O of log n time. And the, and the construction um, in O of n log n time. So it's as fast as sorting, which is as fast as building this, this, this uh, the binary tree. So in 2D, you can actually do um, these queries in, um, in, in logarithmic time, which was the same as in, in 1D, using this, um, by using this Voronoi diagram. If you take the computational geometry class, you'll probably learn how to actually do this. Okay, um, okay so what happens, what happens now for P in R3? So, I drew this in 2D, one, because it's a lot harder to draw in higher dimensions, um, but also because in three dimensions, or let me just write this uh, in 
general by D. In D dimensions, the size in, in general for um, D um, dimensions, the size is now unfortunately O of N to the D over, it's the, it's the ceiling of D over 2, O of D over 2. So, um, so for, <coughs> for, for D equals 2, here we are, D equals 2, this is 1, for D equals 3, this becomes a 2 here. So it's going to be n squared size. It starts to become big. For, for higher dimensions, like for in six dimensions, or in seven dimensions, this is n to the fourth, the size of this diagram. And so to do nearest neighbor queries, you're essentially working on this diagram, which itself is really complex. You're essentially, and because you could ask a query which is really close to one of these points, you kind of have to resolve these issues. And so if you're going to pre-process it so you can answer these things officially, you're essentially worrying about this, you're essentially worrying about this Voronoi diagram. And so to answer exact queries in high dimensions is not really going to be feasible. This can either require a ton of space or a lot of time or, or both. There's a way you can use a lot of space and get the query time efficient or you can use Less, um, less space and get the query time to be slower. Um, but it's hard to get, or there's ways you can trade off in between these. But it's hard, hard to get both. Yeah. Does the query, um, does that also scale with, uh, with the amount of dimensions? Yeah, so the, the, there are various ways to trade off the size and the query time. So one way is to not compute the full structure, kind of to build a First, divide up the point set into kind of local parts and then build that structure on each part. And in that way, you can trade off, um, or you, actually, what you do is you'll, or you, another way I think is to sample, take a subset of the points and then build the structure on those subset and then recursively do that on the pieces. And there are various ways to trade off the size and the query time, but one of them has to be good. Okay. Um, so if you want to do it exactly and you care about the worst case running time um, and the algorithmic complexity of this, we're in, in kind of in trouble in higher dimensions. Um, so what, so, so um, I'll, t I'll talk about, well, so, so what, instead what people consider are these appro approximate um, nearest neighbor queries. So instead of saying, I want to find the exact nearest neighbor, let's, let's loosen this a little bit. So let's say, again, that P star equals um, R min of P of, P of uh, right? And so, and so I want to... And, and just to simplify notation, I'll say this. And so, so my goal now is to um, find a p hat such that the distance from p, p hat to p is less than 1 plus epsilon times the distance from P star to Q. And so now this, this epsilon is going to be some error parameter, say, between 0 and 1. So often we make the small think of this as, say, 0 0.1, right, as the value of epsilon. So I, I can be off by 10% of the distance. So if the distance is small, I'm going to find something else that has a small distance. Right, so now if I look at this picture here, um, so if I'm close to the boundary and I don't know which of these, which of the two points is closer, I could think of drawing a ball around the distance, so if this is Q and this is P star, then I can expand the radius of this ball by an extra 
one plus epsilon factor. So an extra 10%. And now it's okay. And after I do this, either of these points, which are in this expanded ball, are okay to return. I have more options. You think, well, that one on the left seemed like that would have been the best choice, but actually the one up top also would have been reasonable. Okay, and so, so, if, so this hopefully should seem like a fairly reasonable thing to do. We care about is there something close enough? And so we really often care about this, this distance and we have, so if we have 10% error in the distance, that's probably enough to say, is there something close enough? We want to find something close. You know, usually we, if we have something not quite exactly the closest thing, but close to that, that that's going to be helpful. Um, it's, it's another good example, which is close to our query. Um, so another reason is that, remember, these distances that we chose, we're using the Euclidean distance here. but this choice maybe was also arbitrary. If we changed what distance we were using, maybe p hat was closer than p star. I'm not sure. Right? The choice of the distance was also a little bit arbitrary, so you shouldn't care so much about getting the exact minimum as opposed to something that's close to the exact minimum. That should, should in general, work just as good. So this is a, hopefully this seems like a fairly reasonable um, approximation to this. Um, and so, if you allow for approximate nearest neighbor queries, then you can, then stuff becomes a lot easier to do. Not, it's still hard in higher dimensions, but it becomes more possible to still use these techniques. Okay, so, oh, my notes just closed up. Um, so, So this was small dimensions. Let's talk about now these. Um, these medium dimensions. And so for medium, this is kind of a term I've, I've made up. I feel this is really, say, D is in, say, 3 to 12. To me, that makes sense as medium. Two is low, a lot of nice stuff works. Sometimes some of the low dimensional stuff will work in three dimensions. Um, you can kind of get those structures above to actually, there are ways to actually get stuff kind of like this, these query times to work fairly well in, in 3D actually. Um, but 4D, this, everything starts to break down. Um, so you can like do these approximate Voronoi diagrams. And, and those in three dimensions are still still very reasonable, but you can, you can do the exact for the one three D. But in general, three and higher dimensions, you you want to use something else. Um, okay, so the the right way to think about this is not so much like the Voronoi diagram, but like this binary tree version. We want to do something like a binary tree in higher dimensions, and I'll draw examples again in two D because it's hard to draw in high dimensions. Um, how would you do a binary tree in higher dimensions or something like a binary tree? What's the right generalization to two dimensions? On, on the here, KD tree? Yeah. Yeah, great. So one option is a KD tree. And so the idea is that, again, it's going to be binary and you're going to split. So let's say that my data looks like this, and so in, I can't just, just dividing it by x coordinates is not going to work, but starting by dividing it by x coordinates is going to work okay. So I'm going to divide it up into cells starting at, say this will be like the median point in the x coordinate. So think of sorting them all this way, and then this is the fifth, so I could have picked the fourth or the fifth, doesn't matter so much. Um, let me add some more data points. This will look a little bit nicer. Let's see if I do these well. Okay, so now, so I can split here. So this will be the, the top node of my tree. If I have a query, I will say am I the left or the right side of this line. And then I, I, I want to go down a level 
And then I want to again split on the median. And so on this side, I'll split on this point and, uh, and maybe over here, I will split on this point. So, there, so the second level down, I'll split on the y coordinate um, instead of the x coordinate. And it has to be a different split on each side. Right? So then I'll recursively do this. Then in the next level again, I will pick one of these 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 data points and split here, or I'll split uh, here, or and so again, it's different in each of the sets. And I'll keep splitting until there's one or maybe actually a constant number of points in the, in the leaf set. Usually with these structures, if you're really making them large, you want to stop when there's when there's a constant number, say like 20 or 50, and do a brute force search at that point, instead of doing all this extra business. Um, so now, I, so the, the k to tree will look like this. I can replicate this binary tree structure. Um, okay, so, so now let's go through an example with a query point. Let's say that the query is here. How would I find the nearest neighbor of this? Well, I'd start and go on this uh, on the right side of this line, and then the bottom side of the red one, and then the left side of this one, and I'd say, okay, this might be the nearest neighbor. But it might not be, right? If I draw the circle around here with this radius, Oh no, it's intersecting these, these, uh, it's intersecting these other cells. Um, in fact, let me pretend it went a little bit larger. That was good. It was a little bit larger here, okay. So, it's intersecting these other cells here now. Okay. So, what do I need to do now? Well, I go back up the tree. I'm at this node of the tree, I go up, I check this cell, which is so I can parallel to this. I can also draw like a like a tree, where this is the top split, and then I have two y coordinate splitters, and then back to two x coordinate splitters. And let's say that my query point ended up down in here. So I first have to check its neighbor cell, which is over here. I check this one. I find the closest point in here. It turns out this was a little bit further away. So then I say, okay, this, this is still my ball. I go back <coughs> up the tree to here. And now I'm in this cell. And I see that this split point is actually closer. So I've shrunk, I've shrunk my radius a fair bit. It turns out this is the nearest neighbor according to the picture. Um, but I still, I still need to check the two children of this guy. I need to check the children going down here. Um, and so I go down and check, and they're empty. But I still intersected across this line. So I have to go back and check the split. And indeed, my circle crossed here. So I go back down here and, and have to check like one of these cells. Okay, so you have to go and walk around this tree, and you keep pruning off parts of the tree. I did not need to go into, for instance, this whole subtree, because this circle never crossed over here. And you can do that with some geometric check to the, essentially, the rectangle form right here. Okay, so this, this gives me the exact nearest neighbor, but it might take a long time if I'm going up and down these trees. There's some kind of formal bounds you can prove on how many times up and down, but it, it grows with the with the dimension, and it gets closer to to to, to um, gets closer to being linear to get to higher dimensions. Um, okay, so if I do the, instead this approximate nearest neighbor, then what's happening is that I, I only care if I'm within a one minus epsilon of the query point I found. So if I started with this point. 
then I'm okay if this is not the absolute nearest point. If there's a point that lies in between the orange circle and the gray circle, that's okay. I can skip that point. It's closer, but not that close enough I care about it. And that meant I did need to search this subtree. I pruned off this extra subtree here. And then when I found this point, I've again shrunk this circle a little bit. And so now, so now it turns out I didn't need to check this subtree because it didn't cross here, and I didn't need to cross over this other whole half of the tree. Turns out shrinking these circles a little bit ends up helping a lot. Um, it, 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 it allows you to prune much more of the tree much more efficiently. Um, so th this is close to what is used in practice using what's, um, so, so there's this package um, that you can do for these, um, these, these um, uh, for doing these approximate nearest neighbors that works fairly well in three to 12 dimensions. It depends on kind of the ambient dimension of your data. If it's actually very full dimensional, it may, not, it may only get up to like eight, something like that. I've heard people use it up to unchanged up to 20 or 30 um, in, in some cases. And so this package is called the ANN package. Um, I think if you search for ANN in Google, it'll be on the top page. And this is a nearest neighbor package that's pretty efficient. Um, okay, so this is just to kind of give a more complete story here. These are, this is how they do it in practice, what's actually used to, so, so well, there, there's an, um, <laughs> there's another um, thing used in practice in, in, in databases often called an R tree. So there's these notions of these, of these B trees. If you've taken the 6,000 level database class, hopefully you've, you've talked about the, the B trees already. And these are these one dimensional structures that, that use that the data is stored when it's on disk, it's really big you bring it into memory in a whole block at a time. And so instead of building a binary tree, here it says each of the leaf nodes is a huge block of like, um, like several hundred or a thousand or thousands of data points. And then it has a that way split. So it's a really short tree with really wide splits. And so each item of the tree is a whole block that maybe has a search tree inside of it so you can split more easily. Um, those are kind of there are ways to generalize those to higher dimensions. Um, one common one is an R tree, and what it does is it thinks that the, the data, let's see if I can draw a decent example, um, it's, it, it doesn't try and enforce these splits the same way before. It thinks, okay, at some level, the data is all inside of a, of a rectangle. The R is for um, rectangle here. And then it doesn't try and split these down the middle because it'd be kind of more lopsided. Instead, it, it says, let's try and fit each the, the data set recursively into rectangles as small as possible. Rectangles tend to work easier for computation because they're axis aligned and it's easier to kind of work with the X and Y coordinates independently. And so it does this recursively. It has a, tr a tree, so the top level it's, it's going to be this big green rectangle, and then there are going to be these three red rectangles at the next level down, and then you could recursively split those. And each of these may be a whole block of data. And when you're having a wider split, this, this tends to work better, especially if data is clumped in various ways. So this R tree is also very popular in some areas. What's usually used to prove things formally about it is, is a um, a quad tree, or actually a, a um, just to mention this quickly, a compressed quad tree, technically. Um, and so, or this could be an oct tree or a two to the d tree. This one instead says for some, some data set, it says, I don't care what the split is here. I'm going to first say everything is in a cube, and then I'm going to pick the geometric center of the cube and split this two to the d ways into cells, and then recursively do this until the cells are empty. Um, 
And so, so I, I don't need to do these cells here because they're empty, for instance. And so this is a geometric split, which means that the, uh, the ratios are better. The, the KD tree, in some cases, it can, these things can get really skinny because you're splitting on the median point. And that it ensures that the level of the tree is, is log n, um, but it may get skinny in the worst case. In practice, it generally works fine. The quad tree ensures that all the boxes are round, so you get nicer geometric properties. Um, and but in short, it, in order to keep the level from getting too, too close, what can happen is you can get some points very far away and then two points really close, and you would need to keep splitting these, these down. You know, and, and I keep going recursively down, and I don't separate these points. What you can do instead is say that the compression is that there's some cell down here, and I make this a direct child of this node if there's nothing in between. And then this kind of deals with some of these issues. And if you want to prove any bounds, you can, you can do something like this. Uh, you, you can build this in something like, I'll probably get this log, n log, n plus one over epsilon to the d time, and the query time to something like log n plus one over epsilon to the d. Um, so if epsilon is large, then maybe this is, and d is not so big, this is maybe not so bad. But these only work reasonably well in two or three dimensions in practice. Okay, so this is, this works for, this works for medium dimensions. So I said like d equals 3 to 12. And usually the KD tree is the right way to do it with these approximate nearest neighbor groups. All right, so um, what, why do these break down in high dimensions? So let's say D greater than 20. So this, this is going to be kind of, or maybe greater than 12. Greater than 20, definitely bad stuff starts, starts to happen. What, what's, why is this, why are these not going to work so well anymore? So, so who's heard of the um, so-called curse of dimensionality? Yeah, so kind of when you're dealing with high dimensional data, often you can't use your intuition from low <coughs> dimensional geometry. And often the algorithms that are associated with those don't work either. So, so, so kind of the main problem here is that usually these structures are based on, at some level, they're based on like these boxes or these squares because you, you want to split orthogonally because then you can use the coordinates and it's pretty easy to do. Um, but the distance, but when you look at the distance from something, it's inherently using the Euclidean distance, it's a circle. Um, so, if you, so those don't match. And now in 2D, this isn't so bad. There are some corner spots I've missed, but they're not off by that much. Even if you make your epsilon large enough, then these are roughly the same. Okay, but in, in high dimensions, in high dimensions, proportionally, these corners get bigger and bigger. Um, and it, it becomes that the circle, you look at the biggest circle or the biggest ball that fits inside of a, a, a box, um, the volumes of those are drastically different. Okay, so, so let's kind of see the... Um, so, so let's consider, I, I think the easiest, the, the, um, so the, the kind of a nice way to look at this um, is so to look at, call this VD of radius 1, this is going to be a, a ball in 
say an RD with radius 1, and what is the volume of BD1? Do you know what the volume of a high dimensional ball is? Well, it's, it's not something you can actually write down in, in, in closed form. It's pi over d over 2 times over the gamma function of d over 2 plus 1. The gamma function is this weird function that is, it's defined well for, um, for I think, for odd numbers. Um, but you can, you can write it down approximately, uh, so d over 2, it's so, for, it's, it's basically d over 2, um, the factorial of d over 2. Everyone knows what the, what, what factorial is, right? It's, it's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 up to d over 2. Um, and so, which of these is bigger, pi to the d over 2 or d over 2 factorial? Factorial is much bigger, right? They both have d over 2 terms. The first one here is smaller, but after they get bigger than pi, all of these are bigger. Right? So it's closer to it's closer to d to the power d over 2, right? Which is bigger than a constant 3.14 yada yada to d over 2. Right? So this is bigger, which, but for all the illustration, all I want to say is this is less than 1. Okay? So it's the volume of a ball of radius um, 1, when you get to d is large, this is going to be less than the volume of 1. Okay? Now let's look at the volume of the cube. Um, so in, in d dimensions with radius 1. Right? So this is equal to um, minus 1 to 1 to the d, right? So it's this range from minus 1 to 1 to the d. So it's actually a 2 by 2 cube, right? If this is radius 1, then I need a 2 by 2 cube to fit in here. What is the volume of this cube? 2 to the d, right? So this grows really quickly with d, exponentially quickly. This grows really high. This one is less than 1 and shrinking. This one is growing exponentially. So the volume of the cube is contained in is much larger than the volume of the ball. And so essentially in these data structures, you're trying to approximate um, this distance function with these cubes or cubes that I've kind of tried to combine together with the KD tree or these rectangles even that had skew to them, right? The quad tree at least has the right proportions the KD tree could get even skewed, so it'd be even worse approximation because it'd be off in some direction of the water. So this is really why this breaks. I mean, this is one way to see why it breaks down. There are, there are other ways to see it. The, the interaction with the Mornay diagram is another one. But you get all these bad situations happen. Um, OK, so, so what can we do? in high dimensions. Are we, are we hopeless? Um, and as I mentioned, there's this a &N library, which is for, pretty nice to use. And this can work for d and maybe 2 up to, you know, up to maybe 20. You can get this to work um, in some cases. Um, so, and then there's also this um, locality sense of hashing. <laughs> It, it, and, and by saying it works by 2 to 20, basically I mean that it's working better than the checking all, all distances. So you can always spend linear time with just storing the data set and check all the distances. That always works. It works, it can improve on that up to maybe 20 dimensions. And the LSH will work well if n is really big. If n is, 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 uh, is, very big. Um, so the, the dimensions don't matter, but in order for the constants to kick in for LSH, you really need that big. I'm talking like maybe like, you know, like 100,000. And, and the ANN will work better than LSH 
something's up to like around again, again around 12 or 20 dimensions, depending on your data. Okay. But neither of these is what people typically use. These are kind of the LSH has been used a lot, but people realize <coughs> that you can do something based off of the kind of some modifications, um, mods to the um, to, um, to, um, to the KD tree. So do something like the KD tree, but modify it a little bit, and you can get things up to um, a f up to a few hundred. And so, the, in, in fact, when, when I talked about these SIF features in 120 versions, <coughs> they often use these modified versions of the KD tree, and often these will outperform LSH by um, um, by a bit. Not these about LSH actually works fairly well on those, but you can do better with these modifications. Um, so, how does this? How would this work? Why? I mean, after all, all I told you about the Vorne diagram and these and the circle within the box kind of um, issues, how could how could this possibly work? Why would you be able to do searching efficiently? You're gonna so one kind of phenomena that this leads to, well we'll see this in in a we'll see this in, in another lecture is that in high dimensions, most of the distances look more and more similar to each other. A lot of the distances look especially if you do random points inside of a, in, inside of a ball, or inside of a, a cube, most of the distances are going to be very close to each other. So if you use an approximation, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to be easier to find some point which is close. But these are kind of random points that all the distances look roughly close. Um, if you have structured data, you're doing this because you think there's interesting structure. You think this distance means something. So, so often data um, is in 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 um, is going to be. Um, Often data is going to be um, kind of inherently lower, lower dimensional. It's not. It's going to have d coordinates, but it's going to maybe this means it kind of lives close to a lower dimensional subspace. Or if you look in a local neighborhood, all the nearby points lie in a lower dimensional subspace. Um, there are various ways to to kind of to um, there are various ways to capture this in in one way. Is is called the um, is is idea of this uh, was called the bounded um, the bounded doubling dimension and there the idea is if you have a, a data set and you draw any ball around the data set um, if you draw any balls centered around a point and then you try and cover all of the and so it's, this is any radius r. You try and cover up all the points with balls of radius. These should be a bit bigger. Balls of radius r over two. These balls of radius r over two, and then take the log of that number. That's, that gives you an approximation of what the ambient dimension looks like. So if in 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 two dimensions, you can cover, um, or in, in D dimensions in Euclidean space, if they're full dimension, you can always use roughly two to the D balls and cover a ball of twice the radius. Um, so if, if your data happens to have this property everywhere, you say the doubling dimension is bounded. There are other ways of defining this notion of the ambient dimension of the data, but this is kind of a common one. And then if you get to smaller and smaller radii, eventually, there's only there may only be one point in there, so you can cover it by one. So it's the maximum of the log of the number of points of the, of the number of balls that you would need. Uh, and, and so this is kind of one notion. And so the idea is kind of you know in one D it's kind of or two D it's kind of illustrating this picture. If it's inherently lower dimensional, then it kind of lies on a line. 
right? So I should be able to do something then like these lower dimensional structures. In 1D, I could build a binary tree. In low dimensions, I can do something like a KD tree where I split along one of the coordinate axes. Okay, but what I want to do instead of using the coordinate axis, which is easy to do implementation wise, I want to pick a different way of splitting the data. Okay, so the idea is um, so I'm going to build something just like a KD tree, but um, smarter. Um, splits. So, so, so if my data kind of lied kind of like this, then so there's some data set here and some here, then really I really want my split of my KD tree to kind of divide these in two parts. This is really what, what I, would, I would like to do. And I don't need it to be access aligned. In this case, maybe access aligned would have been fine. Right, but but I can I can pick it to be arbitrarily um, arbitrarily rotated, rotated, and so you know in general in higher dimensions this is a half space, you can define it locally with just just the normal vector and so forth. Um, so so how would I pick these half these splits better? How would I better split these these data sets instead of just alternating through the coordinates and <coughs> and, and picking the median? By groups, uh, um, um, is that what you said? Yeah. So, so one way there are kind of two, a few common ways to do this. One way is to cluster the data, and so we'll use um, a version, use something like k-means or k-centered clustering, which we'll talk about next week, and just do this into two clusters. So think of these points are here and these are here, and then make sure you divide the two clusters in some way. Or maybe the clusters come with the center point here, and then you pick the half space which is orthogonal to the line between the center points. So at every level, just pick two clusters and then split these clusters. Um, the the other way is to do something like some, and we'll, we'll see some in later lectures, you would, you would do some random rotations. Um, and so, you know, do a few and then pick the best. So do several random rotations of the space, use the coordinate axis split, and see how well the split works. Is this an even split? Are the points, um, are there, are there um, you know, wh what is the, how skewed are the points on, on, on either side? Have you kind of, wh what you want is that if you look at the, the furthest these points are away from each other or how well they're enclosed in a ball, you want that to shrink really very rapidly. So, um, so you can kind of check that. So you can try a few random splits and then evaluate how well they work and choose the best one. And this ends up working fairly well, too. Um, something I haven't seen published, and, and I think this would work similarly, um, is just pick two random points, draw the line between them, and take the midpoint. The random points, this should you may have to do a few trials of this, but one of these you can do a, a pretty good split. The idea is to, again, <coughs> to adapt onto the data. So even if your data lies locally, looks kind of somewhat flatter than full dimensional, it's going to give you a better split than just using something arbitrary. So if you can somehow use the data to determine the split, it's going to, it's going to work much better. And the key thing you want is to keep the aspect ratio, keep the data sets round, and to keep about the same number of points on, on, on either side. And if you have both of these properties, then it's going to work a lot like doing the k tree in, in small dimensions, which, is, is, which works pretty well. Um, and so this small change onto this, this k tree, and then using the approximate nearest neighbor, allows you to scale this to, to, to hundreds of dimensions, as long as your data is well-behaved. Right? If, if you generated data so it was 
random data inside of a cube, every data point had a random independent coordinate, it probably is not going to help that much. Right? But if your data is structured, you think it comes from something like these SIFT features or like these images of, of useful things or something else that has some sort of structure to it, then, um, then this probably will help and you can get up to hundreds of dimensions. All right. Um, Uh, yeah, so um, anything else I want to, any questions, if I think anything else I want to add? We've got a couple minutes left. So, so here's one kind of thing to think about. I talked about high dimensional data, but having a lower dimensional structure. Why would data have, like does this make sense that it would have a lower dimensional structure? Do you believe that? You know, you, if you, Keep around the talking to people like me, you'll probably hear people say that. Why is that the case? Oh, uh, is it kind of like if you look at a regression, it's almost like your line is like one dimensional? Yeah, so, um, so we'll talk about regression in a couple weeks, and that's trying to fit a low dimensional structure to high dimensional data. But why would it have that low dimensional structure? Why would you assume that? Well, I was just going to ask you to talk about that principle analysis where yeah so, so again that's trying to find it now even random data you can you can see that in pro if it's gendered randomly some way it's still going to have a nice structure because you can't make it too unrandom without enough data points but but why if you had structure to it why would it be there but probably because there are only a few features that are relevant yeah good good right because you know often this data is generated under some process, right? And there's only a few things that actually are governing what's going on. So, you know, if you think, so, so often really big data, you start to see heavier tails, and we'll talk about this, where you get more diverse things. But the, the thing of the example with the, with the images again, um, and so th there's this idea that these images, even if you took more and more pixels, there weren't too many different things going on. So if, if I took a bunch of pictures of the same person, but I had the person change their head by just rotating it left and right slowly, they're only rotating in one dimension, right? I can, there are more and more dimensions the more pixels I get, but there's only one face and it's only rotating under, under one dimension. That one parameter described everything there was about that, about all that data. So it should lie in roughly a one dimensional space. It's really complex, really high dimensions, but really there's one dimensional data going on. And similarly with people, there's so, there are only so many, if you look at faces, so, only, um, so many parts of, of your genes which influence how your face looks. And then you can choose to grow your hair, wear glasses, and stuff like that. But there are only so many traits that influence it. Maybe it's, it's not one, but maybe it's 20 or 30, which is much fewer than, than uh, than like the tens of thousands you have for all the pixels in the, in the image, right? So there's often some very low dimensional thing going on generating the data, and that's why you should hopefully be able to find that and use that to search for it more quickly. Okay, cool, so this was the end of the similarity stuff, but we'll be using this stuff in the next few sections on clustering and then regression afterwards, so.